previous videos about OAuth 2.0 in this playlist, we talked about what OAuth is and what flows mean in OAuth. In case you've missed the videos, there's a link to the playlist in the description section of this video. We learned that the authorization code flow is the name given to the series of interactions that happen between the client application and the OAuth provider, where the client is a server-side application written in languages like C-sharp with ASP.NET, or with Ruby, with Rails, or with PHP. We even saw a demo of that. In this video, I'd like to talk about the implicit flow. Implicit flow is the name given to the series of interactions between the client and the OAuth provider, where the client is a user agent that runs a scripting language like JavaScript. For example, a browser running on a computer, a laptop, or a mobile device. The server hosting the client application does not participate in the interaction at all. The client application is a browser and the JavaScript code on the client makes the request to the OAuth provider directly. I'd like to call out that this is not the flow for native mobile apps written for iOS using Objective-C or Swift or for Android or using Xamarin. There's a different flow for all of them. On the surface, what the end user gets to see, the experience is exactly the same as in any other flow. The client presents the user with a link to click on. The link reads something like sign in with Facebook or any auth provider of your choice. Let's assume Facebook for this example. The user clicks the link. The link takes him to the auth provider, which is Facebook in this case. If the user isn't logged in into his Facebook account already using that browser, he's presented with a login dialog. He logs in. Then he's shown this dialog that says, this application is asking for such and such about you. Would you like to give this information to this application? This is called the consent dialog. If he clicks cancel, of course, nothing happens in that Facebook sends back an error to the client application, which may choose to display it. If he clicks OK, however, he's taken back to the client application. The client application now has his data, and he sees the screen that the client application wishes to present to him next. Under the covers, from a developer perspective, this is what happens. The client first presents a clickable link, which may be an anchor tag or a button, which entices him with the text login with Facebook or some such. To prepare this link, we use the Facebook OAuth URL or the login URL that we get from the Facebook documentation. Whatever flow we use, these base URLs remain the same. It's only the query string parameters that change based on the flow. In the implicit flow, to this URL, we attach the following query string parameters. A client ID. This is the application ID of the client, which registered with Facebook, which is the application making the request. A redirect URI. The URI where Facebook will redirect the user once he's logged in and approved or denied the authorization request on the consent dialog. This has to be a URL in our client application, of course. It may be the same URL or the same page that displayed the link logging into Facebook or any other page. It's basically a page or a script, again, JavaScript in this case, in the client application that will handle the aftermath of the user having gone to Facebook and clicked something on the consent dialog, either having given his consent or his disapproval. Scope is what does the client want to know about the user? These remain exactly the same for any flow, the values of scope, and we've discussed this in the past, but I'll go over it again for those who haven't watched the previous videos. We generally have to consult the OAuth provider documentation for what words to put in the scope field. Let's for the sake, let's for the sake of example, say we want a public profile of a user this is the scope that Facebook gives us in its documentation. If you want something else, 
we'll have to look up the Facebook documentation for scopes or permissions, in the case of Facebook, it's called, to see what we need to provide as a value for this field. A scope is not so much an individual piece of data about a user that the client needs, such as his first name, so first name is not a scope, as much as it is a broad category of data that we need about the user. For example, public profile in the case of Facebook means a broad category of things about a user which he would be happy, which the user would be happy to share with anyone, with the general public, including strangers. So information such as his first and last name, his locale, the language of that locale, an age range, a very broad age range without revealing the user's date of birth or his actual age, and a few other generic pieces of information that you wouldn't mind telling anyone, for example, whether you're a human being or not. <laughs> um, a client can ask for multiple scopes by comma separating them or space separating them. This is totally left to the OAuth provider documentation, so it's best to just read the documentation of how to attach multiple scopes. But the OAuth framework allows for multiple scopes to be attached to the request. A response type is a value that signifies the flow. In a way, it's kind of telling the OAuth provider what kind of a client it's dealing with. Is this client like a JavaScript web app client with client-side code in JavaScript? Or is it a server-side application with C Sharp and ASP.NET or any other server-side language? Or is it one of those mobile native application flows? For the implicit flow, the fixed value token is provided. And state, as we've already discussed, is a CSRF mitigation token. In response, the OAuth provider sends a redirect response, that is a 302. However, it does not send an authorization code in this case. In the authorization code flow, the server sent back an authorization code, which the client then exchanged for an access token by making another request. In the implicit flow, however, the server sends back an access token with this initial request itself. It is sent as a part of the URI fragment. So the response from a server for this initial request itself looks something like this. This is a 302 with the location being set to the redirect URI that we sent earlier. And these are the three query string parameters that come with it. And they're pretty self-explanatory, so I wouldn't describe them. You'll notice though that there is no authorization code here because there is no need to perform an authorization code step because over here, the client application is basically being driven by the user who owns the data. So unlike in the authorization code flow, the client was a server-side application which although was representing the user, it was a proxy. It wasn't really something that was directly being driven by the user. Also, you'll notice in this flow, there are no refresh tokens sent to the client because sending a refresh token could pose a security hazard. Any malicious attacker who got hold of an access token and a refresh token could keep asking for new access tokens based on the refresh token they have. Note that this is possible because an access token is sent in the clear as a part of the URL, thereby being visible not only to the browser, but to any application running on the client device that is able to intercept HTTP traffic. And we know there are legit HTTP interceptors. We use some ourselves for debugging purposes. So please remember that the access token is all that someone needs to impersonate a user and get any information about him, for which scope the access token was acquired. So it's like the movie ticket. You go to a theater and buy a movie ticket, you lose the ticket midway, Anyone else can pick it up and get into the theater. It does not bear the real purchaser's name. So for an access token, there is no way for, the, for any OAuth provider to tie the access token to the user who delegated authorization. And there is no way for the, 
for anyone to be able to correlate that access token to the client application even who made the request for that access token. And so anyone could steal the access token, an application, an attacker, and if they do, you're pretty much screwed. Now, given that this kind of sensitive information is sent as a part of the URL and that the OAuth framework would allow this, would come as a surprise to a lot of people because anyone could steal this URL, which means right now the access token that I'm showing you is mine. And just because I'm showing it to you for the time that it is valid for approximately the next two hours or so, if you copied it and put it down on a piece of paper and you want to do with it, you could impersonate me on Facebook and do whatever you want with it. And basically I'll be able to do nothing. I wouldn't be able to even track uh, what happened, <laughs> but I doubt that's going to be the case. Um, it is for this reason that the OAuth framework mandates that all transport for OAuth 2.0 happen on TLS, that is using HTTPS. Observe that both the client and the server are supposed to have HTTPS URLs. Now, some OAuth providers will be lenient about the redirect URI of the client application not being an HTTPS URL, like Facebook is, but that's a bad practice. The next thing that happens is on this URI is a script that picks the access token out of the URI fragment. This is a script the client application developers would have written. Once the client has the access token, from here on it is simple. With every request that the client sends to the resource server to get some data about the user, it also sends this access token along. The access token may be sent as either a part of the URL or as a part of the request body in a post request or as an HTTP authorization header with the prefix bearer. Which method to send the access token using is dictated by the OAuth provider's implementation. You must read their documentation. In summary, here's the flow again. The client presents a URL to the user. The user clicks the URL, which takes him to the OAuth provider with these pieces of information. The OAuth provider redirects the client to the redirect URI, sending him the access token. The client, for every subsequent request for data, makes a call to the resource server with the access token and the specific fields it requires. The resource server fulfills the request. In the next video, we'll do a demo of the implicit flow.